week. It's been in your bulletin for several weeks. I want to keep highlighting this. We'd love to fill this position from within our church. It is a paid position. Our weekday security desk person, uh, we need somebody to fill that position. If you'd be interested in some part-time work where you can come and you can interact with kids, families here at our church, we really need you. So contact Pastor JD and he'll be glad to share the details about that. Also, a note, last note, this gold-colored insert is in your bulletin. It's about Vacation Bible School. I'm not going to read all of that to you. And there is a sign-up form or registration form on the back side of that. Again, I'm not going to read that to you. If you take the time to look through that, we would really appreciate you doing that for us. We're so glad that you're here with us, that you've joined with us for our Father's Day celebration today. And as we begin this morning, I'm going to ask one of our deacons, Ray Dawson, to come and open us in prayer. morning. Uh, good to see everybody. It's just a beautiful day out there today, a little cooler. Uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, Heavenly Father, you are our Heavenly Father, and uh, you are, take us in uh, your arms, and uh, you, uh, you guide us, uh, and you love us, and you also discipline us, and that's what the fathers, excuse me, that's what the fathers here need to do on earth, just to, uh, we need you more than ever. Our, con our country is kind of going away from what you, you teach us in a lot of, lot of areas, and we need to you get back to what you have taught us. And Lord, is, uh, we, uh, just be with our country. Just uh, be with our leaders. Just give them the guidance that you would want them to have and to, to lead our country to look up to you and our state. And just uh, get our country back to where we Go, we, we listen to you and we listen to your guidance and we read, your, read what you give us in your Holy Bible. And uh, Lord, just uh, as we go through the, 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 the week, just let us be people who, people can know that we're Christians and we just go and we, and we uh, live our life the way you would want us to live it. And uh, Lord, just, uh, just continue to uh, be with us to, as today and every day, and uh, and Lord, just uh, be with the Rodriguez family. I've just been thinking a lot about them, and just think about all the other people who are out there that are contemplating suicide. The hope is in you, and only in you. So just uh, be with all those fo folks, because uh, there's so much in life to live for, and. So uh, as we go through, uh, uh, and just just continue to be with us, and, uh, and uh, everything we do, and uh, when uh, just guide us, and uh, and I just very ups uh, it's very upsetting to me and to everybody else what's going on in the world right now. So also be with all the servicemen that are out there just. To protect them. I say these in your word, Jesus. Amen. Amen. We pray to the Lord today. Praise be, O God, for the Son of thy love.
Okay? Father's Day, we always want to take a moment, we want to recognize our fathers. Hey, let me just say that for all of you guys, because we realize that you may not have been a birth father, but you may be a father to many in our student ministry, our kids ministry, you may have been a mentor through the years to many along the way. For all of our guys out here underneath the TV in the foyer, we've got a table set up. We want to make sure that you grab one of those mugs out there. It's our little gift, just a small token to you today, letting you know that we appreciate you, we recognize you, and we thank you for being a father or a father figure to so many here in our congregation at Newbridge. Now, also, we want to recognize a couple of specific, a couple of special fathers. Just as we do on Mother's Day, we want to recognize the father of the youngest child, we want to recognize the oldest father, and we want to recognize the father with the most kids. So we're going to start off not with the youngest father, but with the father of the youngest child. I think I already know who this is, but we'll see, uh, unless we've got some guests here with us or someone who has had a child in the last week or two. Um, I think that it's going to be around the nine-month-old mark, but let's just find out. So if you've got a child that is two years old or younger, would you please stand? Two years old or younger. And it is, Anne is not a father with a child <laughs> two years old or younger. She is scooting down here to help me out. Um, it is as I thought. So we'll just kind of cut to the chase here. If you have a child that is 10 months old or younger, remain standing. And Bradley gets this. Now, for the ladies, they get a, on Mother's Day, they get a, um, they get a flower or, you know, a little bouquet or a boutonniere, or, I mean, a little corsage. But for guys, we decided to give them a bouquet of tools. And so uh, it's a bouquet of drill bits for our guys. Now, if you're the oldest dad here, we want to recognize you as well. And, and uh, you know, Lori was saying this morning, well, maybe we should have gotten something different for, for the oldest dad. You know, they, they probably already have all the tools. Every guy knows you can't have too many drill bits uh, because you burn through those things real fast. So if you are 78 years old or older, would you please stand? We want to recognize you today. 78 years old or older. All right. Now you're in church. So no lying here. So I could go year by year and we could actually find out how old R.Z. Jeter really is. <laughs> but we'll do it a little differently. How about if you're 84 years old or older, remain standing? Mm. How about if you are 88 years old or older, remain standing? <laughs> yeah, I already know. <laughs> RZ's going to bow out graciously because he doesn't want us to know how old he is. And so, Richard Amon. So if any of you guys want to unseat Richard, you've got to work hard. You've got to add some years to this. And we want to recognize the father with the most kids because we know that children are a blessing and a heritage from the Lord. That's what Scripture tells us. And that the man who has um, many children is like a warrior with arrows in his quiver. So, we want to recognize you, Dad, if you have four children or more. Now, these don't have to be your birth children. These could be adopted children, children that you raise in your home. If you have four children or more, Now, we're going to have a real problem if nobody has five kids. But uh, if you have five children or more, remain standing. Five children or more. How about if you have six? Remain standing. Well, it's good because we got two gifts. Um, so. <laughs> Now, 
And of course, we want to recognize all of our dads. And so please take the time after the service is over, go out there, get your coffee mug if you want to get it filled so that you can have a little coffee on the way to your restaurant where you might be eating lunch or to family members' house where you may be gathering. You can do that, but they're out here underneath the TV, backside of the lobby out here. Now, also on Father's Day, this isn't the only time that we do parent-child recognition, but we always try to schedule a parent-child recognition on Father's Day, primarily because we hold tightly to the biblical truth that the husband, the dad, is supposed to have the mantle of spiritual responsibility in the household. We recognize that we live in a world and a culture where families undergo great change, but the Word of God doesn't. And so the challenge is for the dad, for the husband, to take the role of responsibility in being the spiritual leader, the spiritual head in the household. And so on Father's Day, when we share together in a moment where we recognize our children, but we also commit ourselves to raise our children in a home, in an environment where they come to know the Lord, this is why we schedule this schedule a parent-child dedication ceremony on Father's Day. Now, um, in Mark chapter 10, Jesus speaks these words. Uh, There's a little intro from John Mark, uh, the author of Mark. He says, Then they brought young children to him that he might touch them. The disciples rebuked those who brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was greatly displeased. And Jesus said to them, Let the little children come unto me and do not forbid them, for of such is the kingdom of God. Assuredly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will by no means enter it. You know, since our earliest days, we have sought to bring our children before the Lord. We see it in the Old Testament. We see it in the New Testament. In bringing them, we realize that we cannot make our children choose to trust Christ. No parent can make that decision for their child. I can't choose for my children their faith. However, by continually keeping them in the presence of the Lord, we help that choice become a natural decision for them as they see our faith and as they see our journey with the Lord they tend to make that decision much easier. You know, a parent-child dedication service in our tradition, in Newbridge Church, but in Baptist churches in general, is different. It is different than what you may see in some other faith traditions. In the Methodist Church, Presbyterian Church, Episcopalian Church, Lutheran Church, Catholic Church, when they bring their children, they are bringing their children for a different reason. Often when they're bringing their children, they're bringing them to baptize them as a symbol, as a significant connection with the church. That this is a sign that this child is now bonded with the church. We believe that our children make that decision when they're old enough to understand the responsibility. Also, we stopped using the term baby dedication. And part of the reason for that is because at Newbridge, We believe that while we may lift our children to the Lord, while we may even dedicate them to the Lord, what we do today, this moment, is a parent dedication, a parent-child dedication, where parents say, this is my decision that I am making for my child. This is my decision that I am making for me as the parent of my child to do these things, to take these steps to raise my child in this kind of environment. So, with that in mind, I'm going to ask these families and their children to come stand here with me. I'm going to call them out individually. Now, when I call the names of these parents and the child that they're bringing to be dedicated, or children they're bringing to be dedicated today, there are extended family who are here with them. Now, we're going to ask the parent and the children to come stand up front here, but if you are part of the extended family of these parents and kids, when I call their name, if you would, why don't you stand so that we can see you, recognizing you have a great influence 
on these children's lives as well. You'll remain where you are, but we also want to recognize your involvement in the lives of these children. So I'm going to ask, first of all, Bradley and Catherine Helmick to bring Mark Elijah with them. Mark Elijah. And I have down that he's nine months old. Is that right? Seven months old. I don't know why I keep saying nine. Seven months old. They're going to stand over here. So Bradley and Catherine have Mark Elijah. And if you are part of the Helmick family, would you stand also so that we can recognize you and see where you are? Great. Thank you. You can be seated. Um, I'm going to ask Jason and Whitney Newcomb to bring Jackson Miles forward. Jackson's big brother, who we did a parent-child dedication for a couple of years ago as well, is going to come stand with them. I'm going to have them stand here. If you are part of the extended Newcomb family, would you please stand at this time also? And I'm going to ask Matthew, Matt, and Mallory Nolte to come, and they're going to bring Marshall Lucas and Mace Daniel, and they're going to stand down here. And if you are part of the Nolte extended family, would you please stand at this time? We see you. And I'm going to ask. For Joshua and Caitlin Riley to bring Benjamin Matthew down front here. <laughs> this is why they give me a microphone. I can in general be louder than the kids are, but we love hearing the sound of crying children. Parents may not, but we do. Because it means that we have young families connected with the ministry here at Newbridge. Now, Benjamin is 13 months old. Also, I think I don't think I mentioned that Marshall is six years old and Mace is three years old. And we're glad for each of our families who are here today. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask these parents some questions. But at one point here, I'm going to turn to you because we recognize that while these parents have the primary responsibility, the role of being the main influence on their child's life, you, here in the church, you have a great role and responsibility as well. So I'm going to ask you parents, today, Will you receive your children as gifts from God, recognizing that you are called to love and nurture and to strive to raise them in an environment of faith and love? If so, say, we will. And will you as parents dedicate yourselves to give your children all the love and help they will need as they grow up. If so, say we will. And do you bring your children here today to dedicate you and them to the Lord as you raise them up in the grace and the Word of God? If so, say we will. And I'm going to ask, will you commit to regularly attend worship services at the church of, church of your choice, to provide the church experience that will shape the environment that enables a child to profess Christ as Lord and serve Him as Master. If so, say we will. Okay, now I'm going to ask you, the congregation here at New Bridge Baptist Church, to stand along with me because I have a couple of questions for you as well. As a show of support for these parents, and these families that the Lord has entrusted into the ministry of Newbridge Baptist Church, I'm going to ask you, will you, members and guests here at Newbridge Baptist Church, will you recognize your responsibility to support, encourage, and care for these parents and their children 
as they seek to be a family that honors Jesus Christ? If so, say, we will. And will you promise to pray for their commitment to the attending of public and private worship regularly and to the reading of Scripture so that through word and witness their child will be led to an understanding of God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ? If so, say, we will. We want to take a moment and we want to pray over these children and these parents today. So would you bow with me as we pray? Father, I ask that you would bless these families, bless these children. I pray, Lord, for these parents as they come today showing outwardly, publicly, their decision. Not only to lift their children to you, but to make a public declaration that they will provide the best environment possible so that their child can come to faith in You, Lord Jesus. Pray that You would give them strength. We know that there may be uncertain days ahead for them individually and for us as a nation. But we trust that through Your power and might, these families will not only survive, but they will thrive. We pray this in the powerful name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. All right, you remain standing for just a moment. I'm going to let these families take the Bibles, and there's an uh, envelope that has a letter that we have prepared for them some point in the future for their child to share with them about this day and what it means for, for them that we as a church family have joined with them to pray over them, and they've got a devotional Bible. Now, some of these families are going to take their kids on back towards our preschool area. Some are going to join with our older kids as they head back for Children's Church. I'm going to ask you to take a moment, turn and greet a neighbor around you, maybe a dad, a guy around you, tell them Happy Father's Day, and we're going to let these parents make their way out as our children, our older children, make their way for Children's Church along with their Children's Church leaders too.
Oh.
today. We're here because of our great need. Because we need You more than anything else in this entire universe. We need You. We need Your presence. We need Your comfort. We need Your strength. We need Your power. Most of all, we need Your forgiveness and we need Your salvation expressed in the love of the cross. Father, today we come because we need You. Lord Jesus, today we come because we need You. Holy Spirit, we come today because we need You. And in this moment, I pray that You would use Your Word to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' strong name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. We're going to let our praise team and our band make their way down. I am so grateful for each of them and the opportunity to be back here this week. Yes, last week I was away. And yes, last week we were in California. Uh, no, the trip was not primarily for fun though we made sure that we had an opportunity to do a few things along the way, make a few stops and make it fun. We were there representing you, Newbridge Baptist Church, at our national convention as decisions were made that will impact the church moving forward. I'm not going to talk about those today. Here on Father's Day, we're going to look at our passage of Scripture in the sermon series where we've been out of the book of Romans. I'll take some time later and address those decisions that were made at our national convention. We'll talk about that at some other time. But I'm going to ask you to turn with me today in the book of Romans to Romans chapter 8. Would you take your Bible or your phone or your tablet, whatever you're using, and all of them are fine, if you would turn with me to Romans chapter 8, that's where we're going to look today, and I'm going to read from verses 1 through 17. Now, we're going to be talking about a new lease on life. A new lease on life. We have all known some people. We've heard stories. Maybe you personally have encountered this circumstance yourself. We have all known people who have gotten, quote unquote, a new lease on life. That is, when they thought their life may be facing some end. They had hope, and that hope was renewed. It may be like the woman who was on standby, ready to get on an airplane, but no seats were available with the plane that crashes five minutes after takeoff. She had a new lease on life. It may be like the man who hesitates at a stoplight, just a second or two once it is green. And in that moment of hesitation, an 18-wheeler comes through a red light. I will tell you that that actually happened to me one time in a funeral procession in Martinsville, Virginia. As we were in the funeral procession, the funeral car, the lead car was in front of me. We were stopped at a 55 mile an hour speed zone with a stoplight crossing over a major highway. The lead car headed across the interstate or across this intersection with his lights flashing, the police car in the middle of the intersection stopping traffic. And while the lead car went, I hesitated for just a moment and caught a glimpse. The Lord showed me a glimpse out of the side of my peripheral vision, and I stopped and a car came through doing 55 miles an hour that would have hit me, the second car in the processional, and I might not be here today. Maybe you're one of those people who went to the doctor and the doctor said, the news is not good. You'll need surgery, you'll need chemo, you'll need radiation, but you may only have months, not years. And yet, years later, here you are. You've gotten a new lease on life. We've all known some people like that who have gotten a new lease on life in some way or another. But in reality, this passage of Scripture talks to us about how all of us can find a new lease on life through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And I want to read today here, starting in verse 1, and we're going to read all the way down through verse 17 and use this as our passage, as our foundation for seeing God's offer 
of a new lease on life for all of us. Start with me at verse 1 of chapter 8. There is, therefore, now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, the things of the world. But those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of God, the things of the Spirit. Verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you who are not walking in the flesh, but walking in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God indwells you, now if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. That is to say, everybody who is a believer in Christ, everybody who has come to faith in Christ, has the Holy Spirit indwelling them. If the Spirit does not indwell you, you're not his. Verse 10, and if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11, but if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12, therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh you'll die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons and daughters, the children of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children than heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. I want to talk to you today about God's offer for a new lease on life. Now, I know it's Father's Day, and I thought about tailoring this message specifically to fathers, But I think this message applies to fathers and mothers and to those who are not parents or just grandparents now and their children have moved on or those who are just mentors in the church. It really applies to all of us. God's offer for a new lease on life is extended to all of us, every one of us here today. And I want you to see with me this offer that He has made for all of us. Now, when we talk about God's offer of a new lease on life, We want to understand a little bit of what he's talking about with this. What does it mean for us as believers to have a new lease on life? Well, God's offer of a new lease on life, first and foremost, for all of us, for every one of us, God's offer of a new lease on life doesn't focus on the past, but focuses on the future. God's offer of a new lease on life forgets the past. It forgets the past. I thought at least maybe somewhere in here I might get an amen to that. Because I know some of you, and I know some of the past that you would just as soon forget. I know some of the things that you would like to leave behind. You'd like to tuck them away in the closet of your life. You'd like to take a padlock. You'd like to lock the door. And you'd like for them never to come up again. I dare say that 
most of us have those experiences. Dads, moms, kids. Wouldn't it be great if we could just put a big mental padlock on parts of our mind that we would choose not to remember? Now, one of the things that the Lord says to us is that he forgives our sin and he chooses to remember it no more. Now, God can use our past failures and mistakes for us to minister to other people, and often he calls those things back up in our memory, not as a point of shame, not as a point to diminish us, but as a point to minister us to other people. He can take those mistakes and failures that we've made in our past, and he can help us to use them as we care for others who are making or have made the same mistakes. But when we look at the sins and failures and mistakes that we've made, God takes them and separates them from us as far as the east is from the west, and he chooses to remember them no more. He is not like, he is not like the guy who went to the doctor, who walked in and sat down in the doctor's office and said, doctor, I'm having such a hard time remembering things. I can't remember where I laid my keys. I can't remember my wife's name. I can't remember the dog's name. I can't remember the... Oh yeah, we don't have a cat. I can't remember. I can't remember all these things. And the doctor looked at him and said, how long have you had this problem? And the guy said, what problem? God is not like that. It is not that God has a memory issue. God doesn't have a problem remembering. God has clear, concise memory of everything. He just chooses to make us into a new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, if anyone has come to faith in Christ, we are new creations. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. We have been made new. He has given us new hope, new life, new relationship. For some of us here, there is real hope in that. When you come to faith in Christ, you are not who you were. You have a new start. God's offer of a new lease on life forgets the past. Secondly, God's offer of a new lease on life emphasizes His goodness, not ours. His goodness, not ours. Verse 3, For what the law could not do in that It was weak through the flesh. That is, my failings, my flaws, my failures, my sins kept me from fulfilling God's law. All 613 laws that were given to us in the Old Testament commands. I couldn't do that. It was not possible for me to do that. I was born with a sin nature, and my sin nature led me to do conscious sin. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He sent Jesus to us and He took on human flesh and He condemned sin in the flesh by living a life that was perfect and sinless. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. So when God offers us a new lease on life, it's not about my righteousness. It's not about my goodness. It's not about the good things that I do. It's about what he did, his good decision, his good act, his good work on the cross. It's all about Jesus, not about me. If it was based on my goodness, I wouldn't get in. And friend, I love you, but you wouldn't either. God is not standing there like Lady Justice with the scales in His hands waiting for the scales to be tipped one way or another with my good deeds versus my bad deeds because in all truth and all honesty, my one sin outweighs any good deeds. Not that I've only committed one. 
But my sin nature, my cumulative sin, makes me a sinner. You know, there are times in life where we all have to depend on someone else's expertise. Someone else's understanding. I remember uh, years ago, Ann and I celebrated our anniversary this past week, June the 11th. I remember years ago um, where we were looking for a ring for her, an engagement ring. And uh, we first talked of getting married, and we kind of went out diamond shopping. This was longer than 34 years ago. We celebrated our 34th anniversary. Um, but we knew nothing about ring shopping. We didn't know what we were looking for. We had no idea we were relying on someone else's expertise. Now, I couldn't understand as we were in the jewelry store. I couldn't understand. It, it, my, my mind just couldn't grasp why some of the bigger diamonds cost less than some of the littler diamonds. And the guy would explain, well, you know, there are four C's you got to pay attention to. you got to pay attention to color, cut, carrot, quality. No, not quality, that's a Q. Uh, clarity. Four C's, you got to pay attention to those. And so this one is clearer. That one's bigger. But this one meets the four C's better. But that's bigger. I, you know, I couldn't get it. I could, couldn't understand. He could have sold us a cubic zirconia that was as big as a peanut, and I would have been happy. But I don't think my wife would have. And so I had to rely on his expertise. All I saw was a stone, but he saw something more. I had to rely on what he saw. I had to rely on his understanding, not mine, in order to choose the best ring for my wife and I as we celebrate our anniversary. Now look, in this relationship with the Lord, many of us think it is dependent upon me. It is dependent upon you to live a righteous life in order to fulfill the requirement that God has for us. If that's you, it's time for a paradigm shift. Because your righteousness, your good deeds, will never get you there. It's only by relying on His expertise, His righteousness, His good deeds, His offer of salvation, through His death on the cross, that any of us can experience life eternal forever in heaven with the Lord. God's offered us a new lease on life, but I can't do it my way. I've got to do it His way. Third, God's offer of a new lease on life changes our perspective about the future. Now, God's extended a new lease on life to us. We have to choose this. What does that mean? Well, God's offer of a new lease on life forgets the past, emphasizes His goodness, not ours, and it changes our perspective on the future. Look at verse 6. For to be carnally minded is death. To be focused on worldly things is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it cannot subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. Have you ever listened to the way that some people talk about the future? Have you ever listened to the way that some people talk about what's coming tomorrow? I mean, all you have to do is turn on some news shows, and when you turn them on 30 minutes later or an hour later, you're disgusted, angry, upset because you think the world is ending on July 20th, 2022. There's no hope. No future, no promise, nothing. Well, I would remind you of a few things in our past where we kind of got this wrong. Let me just use one example. Does anybody, I, this isn't going to connect to some of you younger people, that's okay. 
Forgive us. This is an old people thing. Does anybody remember what was happening in December of 1999? Do you remember that? I mean, I know. I know this is an old people thing. Y2K was coming. You know why this was such a big deal? Because computers all around the globe, from their inception, from their creation, they had all pro been programmed to read the numbers all the way up through 1999. But people all around the world were worried that we were going to face economic collapse, total political anarchy, as soon as our computers had to register the date, January 1st. 2000, because a computer couldn't get it. The electrical grid would be shut down. You couldn't turn on the lights in your home. Your car wouldn't turn over. You wouldn't be able to eat food out of your fridge because it would soon just shut down. You'd have to have MREs. You'd have to have your own generator. Now, be honest. Be honest. How many of you went out and bought some MREs in preparation for Y2K? Yeah, that's what I thought. Chicken, he was, I want to say, I knew a fella who, as Y2K was approaching, went out and bought a whole house generator for his house, bought about a thousand MREs for him and his wife. He bought some chickens because he wanted to make sure that he could have some eggs. He wanted to make sure that he had plenty of water, so he had an in-ground swimming pool put in. They could have access to water. I tell you, he was eating on MRE, MREs for the next three years after Y2K. I was eating McDonald's and Chick-fil-A. <laughs> Praise God. Some holy chicken. We just got it wrong. We got it wrong. We thought the world was coming to an end. It wasn't coming to an end. The world isn't coming to an end until God says it's coming to an end. The world isn't over until Jesus returns on the clouds of glory. And until that time, there's still hope. And there is still a future for all of us. God changes our perspective on the future. And also, for those of us who are believers, even if my life is over, even if my days are done, even if this is the last day that I have on earth, my view on the future should be changed because of Jesus Christ. I should be like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego as they faced the fiery furnace. And the king said, if you don't bow down, I'm going to cast you in. And they said, just listen, O king. I don't know whether our God will or won't. We think that He will save us. But even if He doesn't, we're not bowing down. We need to be like Paul and Silas who were locked up in the prison on threat of death. Who while they're in chains are singing their hearts out inside their prison cell. Because they know that even if they lose their life tonight, they're guaranteed eternity in heaven tomorrow. Friend, it doesn't matter what gas prices get to. And let me just say, in California, where it is over $6 a gallon, I don't think the number of the beast is 666 on the gas pump. I don't think that's it. Our perspective on the future changes. We understand that because I know Christ, because I have a Savior, tomorrow is secured in His hand. It doesn't have to be secure in mine. Two last things. This offer of this offer of a lease on life. It, it, it actually provides a way to please God. Now, over the years, I, I, I've become convinced that most people really do want to please God. They really do. Even today in our world where there is a growing number of those who hold to the religious belief none, N-O-N-E, most people are still religious. 
in some form or another. Most people have a desire to please God. They just don't really know how. They don't understand how to please God. Verse 8 says, So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but you who are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he's not his. We, we want to please the Lord. Um, I grew up in a town east of here. You've heard the name before. I've shared it. Uh, Seaford was the little town that I grew up in. Seaford, S-E-A-F-O-R-D. That ought to give you an indication of the kind of community I grew up in. Sea, word. Uh, we were right on the water. We were surrounded by salt water there. It's actually a neat place to grow up. Um, surrounded by little creeks and stuff all around us. There was Back Creek, Claxton Creek, Chisman Creek, Wormley Creek, Cabin Creek, Bay Tree Creek. Goose Creek, and many of those either emptied into the York River or the Pocosin River, which both of those gathered together right near the mouth of the Chesapeake Bay, and they emptied into the Chesapeake Bay, which of course empties into the Atlantic Ocean, Seaford. Years, uh, years ago, growing up in that community near the water, uh, my family was like a lot of others. We, we had a boat. Now, don't ask me what kind of boat. I don't know what kind of boat. I know it was blue kind of grayish blue at one point in time, kind of had a little wood clabbered stuff on the side of it. We didn't have it long because a boat, as most people who've owned a boat know, it's just a hole in the water that you pour your money into. And we had a boat, um, and we would go fishing out in all those creeks, Chisholm Creek, Wormley Creek, all of those places, Pocosin River. We would fish. I fished with my grandfather as well. Um, living near the water, it's kind of what you did. We fished. Now, as a child... I often focused on how many fish did we get? How many fish did we catch? How many fish did you get? How many fish did you get? Or I focused on how big was your fish? My fish was this big. My fish is bigger than your fish. But you know, in all those years that I went fishing, my dad, and also my granddad, my mom's dad, in those in those years that I went fishing with them, I don't ever remember my dad or my granddad chastising me because I didn't catch enough fish. I don't ever remember getting a lecture. Well, that fish is only 13 inches long. We've got to have 14 inches to keep them. What are you doing? What are you thinking? You know, all the pressure to perform was put there by me, not by my father. Now, for many of us, we become paralyzed with the idea of how? How do I please God? What do I do to be pleasing to God? And we miss the point. The point isn't to have the most fish, and the point isn't to have the biggest fish. The point isn't to do the biggest thing, the best thing. The point is the relationship that is developed while we're doing the thing. The point is that our Father in Heaven wants to have time with you, His son, you, His daughter, you, His child. And the thing, whether it's reading your daily devotional, whether it's reading the Bible, whether it's taking time to quietly pray, whether it's singing, whether it's joining with other believers in a small group Bible study, the thing itself is not the point. The thing is the vehicle by which we grow in our relationship with the one who wants to walk with us, our Father in Heaven. In God's offer of a new lease on life, He's extended this invitation. I want to be with you. Of all the things I could be doing in the universe today, I want to be with you. Which makes this last point one of the most special things. He wants this relation so much that He's willing to adopt me as His child. God's offer of a new lease on life promises an inheritance, not a payment. I don't get paid for doing good things. I don't get paid for all my righteous deeds. I get an inheritance 
not a payment. Verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Verse 17, and if we're children, then we're heirs. Heirs of God, join heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And we all know what an inheritance is. An inheritance is where I receive something that somebody else worked for and earned. An inheritance I didn't work for. An inheritance is a gift I'm given. When God's offered you, He's offered me an inheritance, not a payment. I don't get to spend forever in heaven because I've been so good. Because I've checked the right boxes. Because I've been in church or tithed. Though those are things that we're called to do. It's not a payment. It's an inheritance. It's something that my Father provided for me. It's something that Jesus worked for, sacrificed for, so that I, His child, so that you, His child, could have the security of life with Him. God wants you have a new perspective on the future. Not worrying about tomorrow. But knowing that as we seek Him first, He'll provide everything else. God wants you, me, us, to choose to be in relationship with Him. Knowing that as I enter into this relationship, He forgets my mistakes, and He focuses on my future. My friend, today, God has extended to you an offer of a new life in Christ. Some of you have already accepted, but you're still trying to live as if it's dependent upon you to do all the right things to get there. Some of you are still focused on the past and the failures and mistakes when He wants you to be focused on the future and what He desires to do in you and through you. My friend, today, God wants us all to experience His new lease on life. Pray with me. Father, in this moment, pray that You would help us See the offer that you've extended. That you have invited us into relationship. In a relationship that is one of the most precious that can be found. A relationship where we're children. We promise a future, an inheritance that you paid for, so we might be secure. I pray, Lord, that today you would change our perspective on the future. You'd change our perspective on the past. And that you would help us to take the step to accept the gift of life a changed heart that you've extended to us this day. I pray this in Jesus' strong name. Amen. We're going to share together in closing song our praise band and praise team. They're going to come. So what is it we're inviting you to as we share together in this invitation song? Well, First and foremost, we're inviting you to a new life in Christ. If you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, this is the invitation and it's open. Come. We'd love to share with you how you can start this relationship with Jesus today. But we're also inviting you who have made that decision to trust Christ as your Savior. 
to find some freedom from your past. Maybe you've made some failures and mistakes along the way. Maybe some of you dads are sitting here today and you have some great regrets. Mistakes that you've made. Well, we can't undo the mistakes, but the Lord can set us free from the past that still cripples us. Maybe some of you are concerned and worried about the future, what the future holds. Maybe some of you are at that point in life where every time you go to the doctor, you're afraid the bad news is coming. Maybe you're on the opposite end of the spectrum. Maybe you're in your 20s, early 30s, and you're thinking, I just have no idea what the next 40, 50, 60 years will look like and what we'll have in our world today and have little hope for the future. Friend, today, we want to extend an invitation that in Jesus, in this moment, your faith be strengthened, that our God holds tomorrow in His hand. I've got a couple of deacons down front here with me if you'd like to come. I know one of them would be glad to pray with you, talk with you. If you'd like to come, make this decision to follow Christ as your Savior, we'd like to invite you. If you'd like to just come and stand or kneel here at the altar and pray yourself, that's what this time is for. Let's stand together. We pray, Lord, that You would use this time to strengthen our hearts. We ask, Lord, as we depart from here, we go to spend time, many of us, with family, friends, or maybe a quiet moment at home. We ask, Lord, that You would guide our going. You would help us to share and show Christ wherever we go. In the strong name of our Savior Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Happy Father's Day.